Hello, welcome. My name is Wahoo, and today you are here with me. Let's just take this moment to appreciate we are existing at the same time. And you have immaculate taste and decided to watch my video. Today, I'm going to talk about a book that I read recently about, um, I want to say a bit of a month ago is when I finished it and I wanted to gather my thoughts before I did a whole video essay on it and by now you, you've read the title so you know what the book is now War and Peace I read War and Peace I read War and Peace can I just can I just have a round of applause I read War and Peace like if I ever have to read it for school I can be like Oh, you can't ruin this book for me because I already read it by myself for funsies. And I always um, liked seeing the faces people made when I, when I pulled out this book and opened it and sat down for an hour and read it. I always liked that. Um, but I think that's enough rambling. That's enough of topicness. Y'all know how I like to ramble on and on. But today I want to be concise and, and, and very precise in, in my choice of words. I think we should, um, let me get a glass, let me get a, a, a little sip of water before we actually, that's the chair, not me, hold on. So if you're like me, and you've heard about War and Peace in passing, you know, it's one of those classics, oh, you gotta read it before you die, it's always on one of those lists, you know what I mean? You're probably thinking, well, what is it about? I'll tell you. War and Peace is this epic story about a group of people who experience war and peace. And we follow them and, and their developments character-wise through these events. The characters are Natasia Romanov. Nik no, Natasia Rostov, sorry. Natasia Romanov. I, I just said Black Widow. No, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. <laughs> I just watched Black Widow recently, so sorry. Natasia Rostov, uh, Nikolai Rostov, uh, Pierre Bezukov, Andrei Bolkonsky, Prince Andrei Bolkonsky, Maria Bolkonsky, uh, Prince Nikolai bon Bolkonsky, which is the old Prince, Nick, uh, Prince Andrei's dad. What I just said means absolutely nothing to you, but it will in a minute, okay? So, I have... <laughs> I have my notes here, so if you see me looking down. Okay. <clears throat> so, the first opening scene of War and Peace is a soiree. And whose soiree is it? Anna Pavlovna's. A socialite. This, he, she's, she's older, she's middle-aged. And she's very well-known in society. She's very well-versed in how to be rich and well-liked, basically. And in attendance is our... Our, our two protagonists, our, our two of our protagonists, I'm so sorry, two of our protagonists, Pierre Bezukov, who is a large, um, kind of friendly giant, and he's, he's new money. He, he was not born into it, he kind of inherited it, but at this point, not yet. But he, he runs in, in these circles. But uh, spiritually and socially, he is not on the same level. He is not a socialite. He is not very likable because he speaks his mind. And, and if something doesn't interest him, he doesn't bother himself with occupying his time with it. Like if, you know. Um, and in, in, in this first, I think it's, yeah, this, the very first chapter, not the first page, Tolstoy introduces to us this idea of uh conformity that's that's the that's kind of pierre's um fatal flaw he's he's not a conformist he's an individualist everybody else around him is a conformist which makes him stick out which makes people not like him very much and in a society that values conformity over individual individualism especially during um times of turmoil and and war the upcoming war it's it's also the topic of the of the parties oh there's a war coming so what that's let's talk about that and um, um let's see okay yeah what am i trying to say 
how do I how do I tie that in? Um, you know, it, it's one of those. This soiree is kind of one of those. If you've ever been to like invited to an event that you know you are too poor to be at, like you can you can just tell like oh I probably shouldn't be here. Um, and then and then you find yourself talking about stuff you don't really care about. It's like oh yes let's talk about cryptocurrency oh yes let's talk about afghanistan i'm not saying people don't care about afghanistan it's just like you you only talk about very surface level things at these kinds of parties and it's usually surface level stuff that has a deeper context in the uh in the circles in in the social circles that you can't quite understand because you're not you're not a part of it. It's very ex- exclusory to people of different classes and of different upbringings and of different um, wealths or their lack of. Yes. Okay. Oh, I think I think writing down notes is a good idea. <laughs> okay. So, like I said, I off the top I mentioned Pierre Bezukov. Now, Pierre. I mentioned him first because he's obviously my favorite Um, and I think he's my favorite because he sticks out he kind of goes against the status quo and um, yeah he's just he's just built different guys I guess that's why I like him but um, yeah he's he's like this breath of fresh air The, the, the the stuffy aristocracy is just completely unappealing to me I was very worried that I would get bored with um I don't know the, the these boring ass conversations, the rich people conversations. You know, like their champagne problems. It's like, oh, this isn't really a problem. You're just you're just looking for something to complain because you think it makes you look cooler or whatever makes you fit in more. And it's just like, no, nah, you're just privileged and detached from reality, whatever. But Pierre, um, he kind of refuses to be bored. Like I, I remember. Um, he walked in and there, there was a conversation about, I don't know, a monarch's bad health. And he was just like, nah. and he walked away and, and like introduced himself to someone who was higher than him in the social hierarchy. And everyone was kind of like, oh, like he definitely clenched a few buttholes when he <laughs> a few buttholes definitely clenched when he just introduced himself to the highest um, person in the room without you know being introduced he was just like oh i'm pierre and everyone was like yo get this nigga out of here um (laughs) and pierre is kind of it's kind of funny because you know as you know as men hmm, what am i trying to say the body the body um standard for men is big and muscly and tall and like that's that's the goal, right? Like if you're if you're a short, petite man, then you're gonna have like problems. People are gonna make fun of you for that, and it's just it's a disadvantage to be a, a short man with a small stature. And that's why people kind of make up this Napoleon complex thing, which is kind of funny because this is like a Napoleonic war. The, the book around revolves around Napoleon and the relationship with the Tsar of Russia at the time, Alexander the First. But that's not why we're here. Um, I was talking about male body standards, the tall, imposing uh, figure, male figure. That's the goal, right? Like that's ooh, everybody loves the big, hunky guy. But Pierre kind of sees it as uh, a, a weakness. He sees his figure as imposing to other people, so he kind of finds ways to shrink himself by um, by avoiding conversations where he doesn't really have anything to say. Like he's not he's not the the when you think of like a big man, you think of him as loud and interrupting and like rude and brash. But Pierre is really like the opposite. He's just trying to find um who he is and how he fits in into the society that kinda loves him. Like he's not stupid. He's just he's just open and, and, and friendly. I guess that's what I'm trying to say. Um this is going swimmingly. <laughs> okay. After after Pierre makes his rounds, clenching buttholes everywhere around him, he sits down, takes a seat, and settles into a conversation that he does not care about. You know, just, just sitting silently watching everybody. And we are introduced to... Bum, ba, da, da, 
Prince Andre Volkonski. Uh, I don't like this man. I did not like this man. I felt sorry for him at times, but that's as far as it went. It was human empathy. That's all. I do not care about you, sir. Um, <laughs> Pierre. No, oof, sorry. I got you're on a mind. Prince Andre is rich. Okay. He's a prince. His father's a prince. His father before him is a prince who's still alive. We'll get into his dad later. Um, and he kind of sees himself as above these menial, tiny little conversations. Y'all hear something? It... Oh, I think it's the wind. Um, he he finds himself above these conversations. He he he, he doesn't want anything to do with you know society as a whole and we are introduced to his wife his lovely wife they call him his little wife which is so it's not gauche um not very in vogue for me stop calling women little stop infantilizing women uh challenge um (laughs) and she's lovely she's very charismatic i think her name was lise I don't know. My handwriting is barely legible, but whatever. Her name was like Lise and she's pregnant and she's charming. Everybody loves her. And Prince Andre resents her for this because he's he sees it as a weakness that she wants to fit into society. She wants to be liked and he doesn't and he doesn't or so he claims he doesn't he doesn't want to be liked. But we all as human beings, we all want to be liked. We all want to fit in evolutionarily. That is a fact because otherwise we will die. I, and there are exceptions to this, of course, of course. What about this guy? He lived in the forest for 30 years. Yeah, that's him. He's built different. Don't worry about him. Worry about you. <laughs> Anyways. Um, so Pierre and Prince Andre are, I don't want to say friends, because I don't think Prince Andre has any friends because he's such an asshole. Like, he's, he's that guy that you meet who's like, oh, you read War and Peace? You probably didn't understand it. Here's why. Like, that's him. Like, he's, he's like a douchebag. You don't want Prince Andre in your corner. You don't even want him, like, on on your account. What, what does that mean? Whatever. This is not a man you want around you. You, you, you. you do not hold this man close. Nobody does. And, um, yeah, Pierre is kind of... He has a different idea of their relationship. He sees them as, like, the best of buddies. He's like, we're bros, man. We're frat brothers. And Prince Andre is like, he's big and stupid. And I feel bad for him. Like, that's that's how he feels about Pierre, which is so sad. Because, like, why would you hang out with someone you don't like? I just, I, I've never understood that. If you, if you don't like someone, don't hang out with them. Are you, what? psychotic don't hang out with people you don't like um uh oh yeah this is the like yeah needless to say i don't like prince andre he's he's an arrogant ass and he finds himself to be better than everybody else why no real reason he's not smarter than anyone he's not richer than anyone he's not better looking than anyone like, what do you bring to the table, hon? Like, why why do you have this God complex about you? Like, this unearned arrogance. Like, this unearned confidence. Like, what what do you bring to the table, hon? Good jeans? Great. Now, fuck off. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Sorry. That was a little... Oh, okay, I don't know where all this is coming from. Soiree happens. We are introduced. It's a flurry. It's a flurry. We move on. We, we move. Now, earlier, I mentioned... Pierre's last name, Bezukov, which uh, uh, was a little iffy if that was actually his last name, but everyone just called him Bezukov because he was um, a bastard son of Count Bezukov. And he, he was the oldest. Oh, no, I don't, I'm not sure if he was the oldest, but he was the one that the Count loved the most. So in a, the, the first, in the early part of the book, Count Bezukov passes away. And there is this giant kerfuffle about whether the inheritance is going to Pierre or not because Pierre was his bastard son. And then there's mention of a letter that the that the Count sent to Duke or Catholic or some I don't know, something, something to legitimize Pierre legally as his son. And somebody is trying to find that letter and burn it. 
right there was there was rumor that the letter was still in the house that as long if we destroy it then you know we get the inheritance but it turns out he'd already legitimized pierre pierre is turned with that death pierre is turned into count bezikov and he inherits this large large sum he and i think it's like three houses hundreds of thousands of dollars land servants and so he's kind of raised into from obscurity not quite obscurity but like think of it as like the princess diaries right like oh all of a sudden like oh you're a count and of course the vultures come the vultures are like you know the count promised me ten thousand dollars and you know the count would pay for my son's uniform and you like they swooped in and of course pierre he's kind he 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 just wants to do what he thinks is right he kind of has that tony stark complex like he he himself doesn't know what's right so he kind of looks for other people two other people to see like what should i do what should i do and of course he thinks you know you have to be kind you have to be giving to those who are less fortunate than you so he starts like giving money away like fifty thousand ten thousand fifty thousand money going 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 um yeah and um and it's not until a bit later that um let me see okay yeah now pierre's rich now he's on the same um class level as prince andre but like socially not really you know what i mean because like oh you weren't you weren't born into money you kind of just got it later in life it's like that new money versus old money argument money is money stop playing games anyways after that whole kerfuffle we are introduced to nikolay rostov rostov nikolay rostov now rostov oh that's a lie that's a lie that's a lie that's a lie i'm sorry i'm sorry i'm sorry i'm sorry sorry. we are introduced to prince nikolay now i mentioned earlier prince nikolay is prince andre's daddy right his father Let's, get, let's make that very clear his father now the prince um he's an old grouch and he is cruel to his daughter maria my camera could have started overheating and all up let's say where are we okay prince nikolai old grouchy man when we first meet him he is berating his daughter maria for mm, sending too many letters to her friend heloise apparently um she sends too many letters and it's probably nonsense so the third letter he's gonna read obviously and here uh, the relationship between maria and heloise this is the first and the only time like it's mentioned like we never hear about heloise again but in my opinion some fruity going on some fruity let me read to you what heloise wrote Huh? It's not Halloween she's fruity with. It's another character named Julie Kerrigan, who we never hear from again. But um let me read to you the letter nonetheless. Very much fruity. Tell tell me if this is how you speak to your friends. My dear and excellent friend, what a terrible and awful thing absence is. I tell myself that half of my existence and happiness is in you, and that for all the distance that divides us, our hearts are united by indissoluble bonds. Yet my own rebels against destiny, and in spite of the pleasures and distractions that surround me, I cannot overcome a certain secret sadness which I have sensed at the bottom of my heart ever since our separation. Why are we not together as we were last summer in our in your huge study on that blue sofa, the sofa of secrets? Why can I not? <laughs> Three months ago, draw new moral strength from those eyes of yours, so gentle, so calm, so penetrating, eyes that I have loved so well and seem to see before me even as I write. Is that not the fruitiest shit you ever heard? The sofa of secrets? What secrets, ma'am? Officer? Hmm? Anyway. <laughs> I just thought that was very interesting and I don't think anybody else has ever been like, hey yo, this shit kinda gay. But as a as a as a professional gay, that shit kinda gay. That's my opinion. Anyways, yeah, Princess Maria and the relationship between her and her father, Prince Nicolay, is 
very strange um he's quite verbally abusive to her like all the time and he calls her ugly to her face um let's see where uh, why well, okay okay i didn't i didn't write down but like he calls her ugly to her face like he berates her for her looks to like to the point where she ends up like running out of the room and crying and this is like not the first time this has happened and then Tolstoy is like but secretly he loved her very much secret love is not love at all dude if you're not gonna love me out loud and boldly don't don't confuse yourself don't disillude yourself into believing that you love me just because you know secretly inside uh your heart beats for me i do not care i do not care if you're not gonna show me you love me don't love me at all don't claim to love me you loser yeah prince nicolay choke and he did he died which was funny to me the war starts ah war and peace let's get into the war now the war is about over some it's it's a pissing contest between napoleon and alexander the first like as all wars are a pissing contest between two men <sighs> between two men I, I could just end it there just a pissing contest between two men who would rather you know sacrifice the lives of their citizens than admit any wrongdoing or show any kind of weakness whatsoever um you know men yeah don't you just love them anyways when tolstoy begins the war the war he starts it off like this it seemed as if humanity had forgotten the laws of its divine savior who preached love and forgiveness and were placing the greatest merit in the art of killing one another and i was like ain't that some shit ain't that some shit and earlier between a, a conversation between pierre and prince andre pierre said but if everybody fought for what they believed in there would be no war is that what he said i might be misquoting my man here what did you say sir what did you say to me if everybody fought for nothing okay hold on if everybody fought for nothing but his own convictions, there wouldn't be any wars. And a good thing too, said Pierre. Prince Andre grinned at him. Yes, it probably would be a good thing, but it won't ever happen. Well, why are you going to war? asked Pierre. Why? I don't know. Because I have to. I'm just going. He paused. I'm going because the life I'm leading here, this life, is not to my taste. Can you see why I like Pierre and not Prince Andre? Are we starting to get the picture? Why? Okay. The war times surprisingly weren't as interesting as the peace times. Um, for me, I'm I'm one of those people who, like, when I'm reading, I basically hallucinate. Like, I can see what's happening. Like, the battlefield. Like, oh, he's stabbing. Oh, he was standing on a parapet. Oh, his horse was limping from the arrow. They didn't use arrows. At this point, they had guns. But, like, I can see it. And still, I was like, eh. Not nearly as interesting as the peace times, which is quite strange. Um, you wouldn't expect that. So, war starts in earnest. Prince Andre joins the effort in search of glory. That's, he said, it's not to my taste. That's a lie. He says, he, he wants glory. He wants recognition and he wants fame for his bravery and valor. That's why he's joining the war. Um, and of course, since he's rich and his family is powerful, he gets himself a nice cushy job. He's not going to be a grunt. Hell no. I'm going to be an adjutant. Adjutant? I think it's adjutant, which is basically like a desk lackey, desk jockey for like a, a very, a very powerful general, General Kurtsov, who, yeah, we follow him too, but like. Not really as interesting because we only follow him during the war times, and I don't think like that's when people are at their truest. So I think people are at their truest when they have nothing to do, when they have to make 
do with nothing i think that's when you see who someone truly is and it's not like in these uh test the test of true bravery it's like no sometimes it's just right place right time or you get the credit for somebody else's work and you know the person's dead so why not take the credit i think war is a very ugly thing i I don't support war whatsoever um afghanistan situation very upsetting very upsetting especially knowing okay let me not let me get not get off topic but take in the refugees like that's if i'm gonna say anything it's let's take in the refugees let's do whatever we can to help the people um <laughs> okay let's get back on the topic but it's very upsetting it's very upsetting to see oh my god uh, i don't even do anything i forgot my light whatever man anyway i think the reason i truly don't like prince andre is because he only respects the people he can get something out of or the people that he views as as above him status wise or the people he likes which it's not respect if if it's just the people you like or the people you think are pretty or whatever you're not you're not kind if you're just kind to the people that you find conventionally attractive or i'm getting so off topic this is so but a lot of it ties into you know the life we're living now the current our current reality i just see these these messages kind of um still ringing true today which is like insane this book was written like 200 years ago and we're still like if you're ugly step off uh, like okay um i mean tolstoy was a revolutionary i'm starting to see why the book has survived to the test of time um and also the reason I, t- I said earlier that Prince Andre joined the war effort in search of glory and fame and he wants to be his own Napoleon, right? Because Napoleon kind of rose out of the ranks and earned himself the title of emperor, which like, okay, he, kind of, he didn't earn it. He just like, get it. <laughs> and they were like, oh, shit. Um, but yeah. Prince Andre wants to rise out of obscurity, at least ob- obscurity in the eyes of the general of history. He wants to rise out of obscurity in, in, in terms of history. He wants his name, his legacy to survive. He's kind of the Hamilton of, of, of war and peace. If you guys have en- enjoyed the musical Hamilton by um, Lin-Manuel Miranda. If you haven't, you've obviously been living under a rock. Um... After Prince Andre joins the war effort, and he's and he's decided he's like, oh, I'm gonna be my own Napoleon. I'm gonna be great. I'm gonna do this. I'm gonna do that. There was a battle where the Russian flag got like trampled on, and he was like, this is my moment. And he picked up the flag and like started running with it. And of course, like he got shot. <laughs> I was like, good, good. It'll it'll teach him something. He gets shot, and this is a battle that um, I think Napoleon is at. And once he's shot, he's down bad, and he realizes how he sees Napoleon. He's being um, like on a stretcher by Napoleon, like passing by him, and he realizes like how small and pathetic this um, poisonous dream has been. And does he learn from this now? Not at all. He merely just pivots and he's just like, instead of being Napoleon, I want to be an Alexander. Like, just be your own man. Stop it. Be your own man. Um, as he's as he's fading from like life. I thought he was gonna die. I was like, oh, thank God. But now, <clears throat> all the things that Napoleon stood for seemed so trivial at that moment. His hero seemed so petty in his squalid vanity and triumphalism compared with that lofty, righteous, and kindly sky which he had seen and understood that he couldn't reply. Yeah, dude. Um, it ain't all that. He, he's literally just a man. He, it ain't all that. But um, in the meantime, while all of this is going on, Pierre did not join the war effort. 
because like he's figuring out being rich you know what i mean like he's he's new at this this is new to him and he's adjusting to this position of wealth and power he has servants now wow that's crazy you got servants that's crazy i don't can i have some i'm kidding but um again he's kind of living in autopilot he's doing He's following in the footsteps of those that came before him. Okay, so you inherit this money, you clear up all your debts, you get married to a beautiful woman, you have babies, and then you... Oh, sorry, my camera's overheating, so it cut me off. Anyways, you have babies and you die, and like that's the prescribed way to live a life. And uh, let's talk about our last topic here, because... Now this video is getting too long. There's going to be a part two and a part four and maybe a part three. But um, Tolstoy also heavily discusses death and the effects of it on people and like how they lead their lives. And we, we see death often portrayed as, as like a wake up call that, oh, I've been living such a lie and, and I should have done this. I should have done that. I should have done this. And um, yeah, we just see that woven in through war we see we see the effect of that woven in through the peace times we see people kind of um rationalizing differently because now also the trauma of near-death experiences and um i think that's all i think that's all i have to say it's just it's just very interesting and it's and it's Death is quite the character development tool. Let, let me just say near death experiences or death in a family, it's quite the character character, you know, um development. It, it, yeah, it, it breeds quite the character development. But um I think that's all for today. I've I've talked long enough. But uh, thank you so much for watching this video today. My name has been Wahoo. I I have been Wahoo and you have been gracious enough to let me talk. Um, thank you so much. And if you haven't already, make sure you like and subscribe. Support a girl in her in her journey of YouTube or whatever have you. Come back next week, Tuesday, and we'll have a sit another sit-down, and we'll get to the bottom of this. Thank you so much.